Hello everyone, this is Dale from the Precept Classes in Coleman, Alabama, and I thank you for being with us today. Uh, we're looking at the book of 1 Samuel, and so I hope that you've had a chance to view lessons 1, 2, and 3. We're up to lesson 4, and today we're going to look at chapters 13, 14, and 15 of 1 Samuel. Now let me encourage you that you really be studying to show yourselves approved. In our time together, we actually spend time during the week studying. We spend four, five, six hours uh, doing homework. It's been quite a while since a lot of us have done homework, I know. But we look at what the Word has to say. We do a lot of cross-references and checking out of the Scripture. And this time together, we can't quite do that. What I can do right here is just give a big picture of what we covered in our classes, uh, especially for those who are in our local classes and they're out of town or something like that. They can still stay in touch. But you would still do well just to do the reading on your own. So if you haven't read um, chapter 13, 14, and 15 of 1 Samuel, do that. Take a moment. It won't take but a few minutes. And go read it. And you'll see what's going on. So in chapter 13, what you see is that Saul has uh, several thousand men with him that are stationed with him at Michmash. And this is the first time you see that his son, Jonathan, is actually mentioned as being old enough to lead uh, some men. He's got a thousand men. So that's sort of interesting because that gives us some insight into some time frames uh, down the road. Uh, I'll just tell you what it is. Jonathan was probably a good bit older than David, probably a generation ahead of him. And quite often when you uh, see the story about them, you think that they are contemporaries in age also. They are contemporaries because they lived at the same time, but they're probably not of the same generation, or uh, at least Jonathan was a good bit older. So the Philistines are camped uh, against the, uh, uh, the armies of Saul. And in verses 8 through 14, you see that Saul was appointed by Samuel to wait until he arrived. Well, Saul waited seven days, but he grew impatient. And there's so many things within this particular lesson that really speak to the body of Christ. And so let me just touch upon them, and you can take them and meditate them upon them later on. Um, this is one of them, because what happened was Saul saw that the people were frightened and that they were scattered because of the Philistines. And Saul was sitting there saying, we've got to do something, we've got to do something. And that is so much the mentality of the body of Christ, particularly the leadership of the body of Christ. I don't know how many times I have sat in gatherings and people are sitting there saying, well, we've got to do something, we've got to do something. Sometimes they'll say, well, there's nothing else we can do but pray, which that's the primary thing we should be doing. And so Saul grew impatient with waiting upon Samuel so he stepped out and made the offerings himself. Saul, as king, did what only the priest was supposed to do. Well, you know what happens as soon as Saul does this, uh, Samuel shows up. And Samuel says, what have you done? And he confronts him with his sin and tells him that he's acted foolishly. And he tells him that because you've done this, your kingdom is not going to go beyond you. You're not going to have a line of kings within your family. So this is the first hint we have that the king... Uh, uh, the kingdom of Saul is not going to be long lived, okay? There, uh, there is apparently no attempt on Saul's part to repent because of what he did. He just sort of said, well, you know, I tried to make an excuse for it. I said, well, you weren't here yet, so I had to do something because the people were leaving me. It's one of the biggest mistakes, that particularly leadership in the body of Christ, do, is that they do things because they think it's what the people want to do or the people are going to lead them. Let me just encourage you, just seek the Lord and do what God tells you to do and let Him take care of all that, okay? So we see that from verses 15 through 23 that Samuel leaves Gilgal. And these verses give more insight to what's happening with the battle. And the bottom line is the Philistines are coming and the nation of Israel is not prepared uh, because, uh, and you got to remember this has happened about the time of the judges. And so the Philistines were the one that had all of the ironware and the ability to make spears and stuff. Saul and Jonathan were the only two that had a spear or a sword. In 1 Samuel 14, you see that Jonathan is the main character here in uh, this chapter. And he goes forth with his armor bearer and sees this group of Philistines and says, you know, maybe the Lord's going to hand them to us. And you see some great statements here. Uh, Jonathan says one of the best ones. He says, the Lord is able to save by few or by many. He's saying that salvation isn't by how many you've got or your great plan. It's by whether God is in it. And so he's basically saying, Lord, if this is you, make straight the way. And he does. And they ascend the height. There's a great account. Make sure you read it. And, and they start having victory over these men that they're attacking. Well, Saul is down in his camp doing what he does, which is sitting there under a shade tree with a sword beside him with his men circle all the way around him, protect him. And all of a sudden, Saul's watchman realized, wait a minute, something's going on. Something's happening here. 
And so Saul realizes well, something's happening with the enemy, so he calls forth for the ark. When they call forth for the ark, it's going to go in the power of God now, right? Well, he calls forth for the ark. Well, you did some cross-referencing your homework, and you saw in Deuteronomy 20 that God's instruction was that the priest was to speak to the people and to pray over the people. So the priest started doing that. Saul comes along and interrupts the priest and says, oh, that's enough of that. Let's get going. He says, stay your hand. We've got to go fight. And so they went and they fought and they were victorious. Uh, but that that's another picture of the body of Christ. I'll never forget, years and years ago, more than 30 years ago, I had a pastor that did that one time. I was just visiting a church, just helping him out one Sunday. And uh, this elderly gentleman, I'm sure he's a nice guy. I have no idea who he was. But we had done two or three songs, and I was leading the worship. Had done two or three songs, and we had several more, you know, choir special and all this kind of stuff planned. And uh, we got to the end of the song, and the preacher got up there and he said, That's enough of these preliminaries. Let's get on with the preaching. Well, I knew what he meant, but that was sort of the same way that Saul was saying right here. And, and we do the same thing. We want to get on to the thing we want to get on about rather than being faithful and obedient in what God tells us to do. So at the end of this chapter, you find out that Saul makes a really troublesome oath right here. It's really a very foolish oath that causes men to be hungry. And you see what happens. Jonathan comes along, doesn't know about this oath, and partakes of... Um, <coughs> honey, excuse me, that day, and his eyes were lightened. Well, you see some interesting things happening because uh, Saul realizes that something's wrong. He says that there's sin in the camp, and he thinks the sin is in the people, and he doesn't realize that the sin is where? With his son. Well, he says, well, I don't know what I'm going to do, so he winds up casting lights. You did a lot of cross reference and a lot of studies on the light thing, and you found out that the light came, and Jonathan said, well, I'm the one who did it but I didn't know what was going on. Saul was more than ready to execute his son at that moment. But the people came along and said, no, 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 that's not right. That's not right. He's the one that's been leading us. He did it. And the people won the day. Saul made a foolish vow. He was going to fulfill the vow. But the people rescued his son, Jonathan. Now, the last chapter, chapter 15, very, very quickly, we just got a couple of minutes right here. Uh, you find some things out about the Amal uh, Amalek. Saul was told, go attack them and utterly destroy them. In your homework, you did some cross and found the history of the Amalek. They had been the enemy of the uh, Israelites for a long time, and God had told them that he was going to deal with them someday. someday. God told Saul to utterly destroy the Amaleks. Utterly destroy them. In this chapter, what you see that he did, he goes along and he's victorious over them. He's victorious over them. But he brings back the best of their sheep and the best of their oxen. And he brings back their king. This is not what he's supposed to do. He's supposed to destroy all the adults, all the children, all the animals, all of everything. Well, Samuel comes back and Saul sort of bragging, hey, I've done what the Lord told me to do. And Samuel has that great line, you know, that well, then what is this bleeding of the sheep that I hear in my ear? What you see right here, it is extremely important for us to be completely and totally obedient to the Lord. Uh, the great verses are in verse 22 and verse 23 of this 15th chapter. It shows us that God wants obedience more than sacrifice. Saul was saying, Oh, we brought back the best animals to sacrifice to your God, to your God. And he's speaking to Samuel. And it tells us that rebellion is like divination. I like what the King James says. Rebellion is as unto witchcraft. Insubordination is iniquity. It's like idolatry. And what we have here example before us is what we see so much in our life is partial obedience and folks i'm here to tell you that partial obedience is the same as disobedience there is no way that we as believers the most high god can be partially obedient saul was we're going to learn some things about saul don't jump to conclusions about him yet okay just observe what's happening at the end of the chapter you see that samuel carried out the complete will of god he killed agag but you see that it grieved Samuel what Saul had done. It grieved God that he had made Saul king. So let me encourage you to walk in complete and total obedience. And I'll see you again next time.